Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm just <clears throat> gonna wait a couple minutes to start just so that uh, everyone who wants to attend uh, can get into the room. Um, so we'll probably start in a couple minutes. I'll be right back uh, to get it going. So talk to you real soon. All right, we're going to get going. So again, welcome to our webinar on U.S. surrogacy, um, brought to you uh, by Circle Surrogacy and Aid Donation, um, and some of our um, uh, parents to our program and surrogates. I'm Dean Hutchison. I'm going to be walking you through and hosting a little bit, and I'll also be presenting um, uh, in some time. So before I get going, I'm just going to walk through um, some of the kind of housekeeping um, right now you're in listen only mode, so you can only hear us speak. Um, so you won't be able to uh, ask any questions um, verbally. Um, <clears throat> but as you'll see to the right hand side, there is a control panel and there is a place to write questions. So throughout this presentation, if a question comes up that you want answered, just go to that area, write the question in. We won't be answering them while the presentation is going on. We'll answer them all at the end. Um, but if you have to leave for some reason, we this will this is being recorded as we speak, um, and it's going to be emailed to you. So if your question doesn't get answered by the time you have to um, get a step away or you're away from the screen, um, you're going to get a recording of it. Um, <clears throat> tonight you'll be hearing from four of us. So as I mentioned, I'm Dean Hutchison. I work here at Circle. I'm an attorney and I'm the vice president of legal services. Um, you're also after, or actually first, you're going to hear from Solvig. Um, Solvig is a licensed independent clinical social worker, um, and she's the senior manager of uh, surrogate intake and support. Um, after Solvig, you'll hear from Will. Will is a parent through our program, uh, adorable son, um, Cam. And then after Will, you'll hear from Lindsay. Lindsay's an experienced surrogate. She actually um, carried for Will. So uh, you'll get to hear their stories on you know, why they chose surrogacy, what their journey was like, and for Lindsay, why she chose to be a surrogate. Uh, so the agenda will be um, a little uh, four parts. You'll hear from Solving first uh, about Circle itself. What's the benefit of working with Circle at an agency like Circle? Um, what's the process like? how we find our surrogates, how we find our egg donors um, in the application process. Um, I'll speak to you um, about uh, the legal processes involved, the insurance piece, as well as the cost structures and the different programs we offer at Circle. And then as I mentioned, you'll hear from um, Will and from Lindsay on their stories on, on why they chose surrogacy and what the, what the journey was like um, for them. Um, and then after that, um, We'll let you kind of share your own stories or your questions so you can ask us any questions you have 
Uh, and after the, if after this you want to maybe meet um, or have a private consultation, which is going to be more detailed, um, you'll have that ability. There'll, there'll be uh, uh, email addresses, et cetera, you can reach out to. Uh, so just for your knowledge, we do have some upcoming travel uh, domestically. So if you ever wanted to meet us in person and you couldn't make it to our Boston or our California office, um, there is a, you can find this on our web page as well. And I'll read broadcast this page at the end of the webinar, um, but we, we're in New York monthly. Um, we're in California monthly since we have an office there. We'll be in uh, throughout Texas in January as well as Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, in February, we'll be in Chicago and Ohio um, as well as our Boston, New York, and California. Um, and in March, we'll be in uh, Philadelphia, Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C., Miami, um, as well as in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. Um, as well as our normal trips to uh, New York, Boston, and California. Uh, so with that said, I will introduce um, Solving and she can start on the process about Circle and our surrogates and our egg donors. So Solving, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dean. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so really, you know, one of the things when we do consultations, one of the things that gets asked probably first more than so than anything else is, you know, what makes Circle stand out and what are the benefits of working with us as an agency, perhaps over other agencies? And it really falls into three primary categories. Um, so security, experience, and support. You know, as a full service agency, security with Circle really comes from having a host of professionals that work for Circle and live and breathe surrogacy on a daily basis and really are experts in this field. We have a fully staffed legal department of attorneys. We have social workers. Um, we have accountants. We have a full, fully staffed coordination team that collectively work as a group to, pro to provide support to our intended parents throughout their journey experience from day one all the way through birth and beyond. And so in addition to that, we are able to provide additional security to our intended parents financially by offering fixed fee options, which Dean will elaborate a little bit more on later. And in terms of our experience, just in general, you know, Circle has been around for over 20 years and we've been very fortunate to help bring more than 2,000 babies have been born through our program, um, which is crazy to see on paper. <laughs> Um, and in addition to that, you know, we have the professional, uh, in addition to our professional staff, you know, the social workers, the attorneys that we have, we also have many former surrogates on our program, um, parents through our program, former egg donors on staff that also are able to provide that personal experience to help guide our program in the way that we do things. And so between those that have the personal experience and our professional staff, like our attorneys, social workers, accountants, program coordination team, we collectively have seen and dealt with pretty much anything that could possibly happen in a surrogacy. And so when intended parents come to us and are looking for that guidance, there really is very rare circumstances under which someone at Circle has not experienced it and helped walk through intended parent, helps intended parents, surrogates, and or an egg donor walk through a situation. And we also have a lot of support at Circle. We're really fortunate to be able to offer support to our intended parents and to our surrogates. For our intended parents, we have an intended parent support manager who oversees, you know, providing support to our intended parents. We have a Facebook group for intended parents to connect with each other and share their experiences, the ups and the downs. We have meetup groups. Um, so if you want to meet intended parents, other intended parents in person, We've seen that we've done that in Europe a lot, in New York. We have also have reunions. So after the surrogacy is over, having a chance to, to regroup with other intended parents who also have children through surrogacy and see how everyone's doing. And our intended parent manager as well also hosts support groups throughout the year, um, uh, which has been really valuable to intended parents who, who are looking for that uh, those additional layers of supports because surrogacy is a really complex process and having people there to share those experiences can be really tremendously helpful. And on the surrogate side, um, we have every surrogate is provided her own social worker that walks her through the process and provides that emotional support to her through day one of her match all the way until two months postpartum. So she has someone there as well to provide her that support. We also have a Facebook group where women, again, can share experiences, the ups and the downs of their journey experiences, provide support to each other. It's really an amazing 
tool that or um, a resource that they have for each other and it's a really positive environment and one of the things I think we're most proud of of, of how supportive that Facebook group has been to our surrogates and it's not mentioned here but we do have a mentorship program as well so if surrogates want more one-on-one -on -one support from an experienced surrogate we're able to offer that to our surrogates as well and so in terms of the process as a whole, if you decide you want to continue moving forward, learning more about Circle from here, the first stage of your process will be setting up a consultation. And so that'll be a chance for you to have a one-on-one -on -one session with a process consultant from Circle, um, which is, you know, we have a process consultant staff and a lot of them also have additional responsibilities at Circle, which can be seen as a benefit. You know, when I do a consultation, I'm really able to speak to the surrogate screen process because I do that as in addition to doing consults on a regular basis or if you're meeting with Dean as your um, consult as your attorney that's doing your consultation you know he oversees the entire legal staff and deals with the legal details day in and day out and so really the benefit of the consultation is you, you that consultation will be catered to your specific situation and your specific needs and so that consultation usually lasts about two hours. Um, so you'll start there. And from that point, if you decide to sign on with Circle into our program, you'll be welcomed to our program. You'll be assigned the team that's gonna work with you and guide you throughout the rest of your surrogacy process and help you with the next stages, which is choosing an IVF clinic. We have some intended parents who come to us who already have an IVF clinic in place. So we're happy to work with whatever clinic you come to us with as long as that clinic does surrogacy. Um, we also are happy to provide you with recommendations from there. We'll assist you in getting an egg donor match if you need one. And then we'll also assist in helping you match with the surrogate. We'll walk you through that process. And once you have your surrogate, if you need a donor, and once you have that in place, then we'll walk you through the IVF process, which will start um, if, you are, if you already have embryos, then you don't have to go through the IVF process. But if you need to create embryos, you'll do that first and then no matter the situation, the next stage would be the actual embryo transfer with the surrogate that you're working with. Hopefully that will result in a pregnancy. And again, the team, you'll have your whole surrogacy team that's going to be walking you through the pregnancy um, and then it pre preparing you for the birth of the baby. And then after that, helping you get home, whatever that looks like. Again, whatever legal work needs to be taken care of, your attorney, the attorney assigned to your case will be assisting you with that and your coordination team will helping you get home. And then life starts from there with baby. And in terms of journey support, so again, you're gonna have this team that's gonna walk you through this process. So you have an attorney that's assigned to your case, an accountant, um, but the, the the two people that are going to help you navigate kind of everything and coordinate between all of these different parties that you're working with is going to be your program manager and your program coordinator. And so they liaison for all of the parties. They are going to be in touch with you, your surrogate, your egg donor if you have one. They assist with insurance. They're in touch with your IVF clinic. Um, you know, they're coordinating with the hospital and attorneys. They're really making sure that your process is running as smoothly as possible. And if there are things that do come up, if there's obstacles that occur, that program manager and your coordinator are going to troubleshoot and make sure that, you know, again, would get you back on the right track, whatever, whatever comes your way. And so they're really there they, from day one, they're going to assist you in helping to get you matched with a surrogate and a donor if you need one. Once you're matched, they're gonna help coordinate travel for your surrogate and your donor. Um, they will handle all of the payments for your surrogate and your egg donor, um, assist in medical billing and any other third party things that come up. Towards the end, of, uh, middle to end of the pregnancy, they're gonna prepare the hospital as well as you as the intended parents and your surrogate for the delivery. And they'll also assist with, with anything that you need to help return home. Um, again, in coordination with you, the attorney assigned to your case, but again, that program manager and your program coordinator are you're gonna be your go-to people that are gonna assist you from day one all the way until you get home. So for egg donors, so Circle has our, our own egg donor program. And so if you do need an egg donor, we have an egg donor database um, that, and an egg donor department that can assist you in finding an egg donor. And so all of the egg donors, um, 
when you go to our website, you can actually register for the egg donor database at any point. You just need an email address and you can start looking through the egg donors, kind of see what's there. Um, it'll have a lot of information about them. It'll have pictures of them. And so what will, you know, in terms of the requirements that we're looking for, the base criteria would be, you know, egg donors in our program are between the ages of 20 to 29 years old. We're looking for healthy family history. Egg donors fill out a lot of application material asking very specific questions about their family history. Um, you know, that they're not using any legal drugs or cigarettes or there's, you know, no, no alcohol abuse in their history or current and there's some level of post high school education. And so we also, so Circle has their own database, but we also have partner agencies that if for some reason you're not able to find a, a, an egg donor in our database, we can assist you from there. You know, the road doesn't need to end there. Um, but I think it is nice to start with the, the Circle egg donor database, you know, just because we are more familiar with that one and can, can really provide a lot of hands-on experience in that regard. And then egg donors in our program go through a full screening process um, where they complete a social work screening with one of our social workers and psychological testing as well and then they're able to move forward in in the in the IVF process from there in terms of matching with a donor circle we are able to offer three types of um of donation. So there's known donation, semi-known donation, and anonymous donations. So anonymous donations is where kind of like a closed adoption where you wouldn't really have much information about um, or each side wouldn't have much information about the other. There may, you know, li very limited information would be available. Um, and then there's no connection to the donor after the donation is made. Whereas with known and semi-known donation, um, as starting with the matching process, you would have the opportunity to Skype with the egg donor if you wanted to. Um, I think for a lot of intended parents who are choosing to match with an egg donor, it can be really helpful. You know, obviously you have health history and what the donor is like on paper but for some intended parents a lot of intended parents i think it can be very helpful to have a personal connection or just see what this person is like you know see what what their personality might be like and helping and helping them choose a donor um, that will provide the biological uh, material for their child and so the difference between known and semi-known is just the extent to which the information about each party is shared so known donation it may be that you have each other's full names and you know you want some intended parents want to have long-term relationships with their egg donors um, whereas semi-known donation it may be just first name basis um, that sort of thing so there's there's definitely different levels to cater to 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 everyone's comfort level and for surrogates, so this this is my specialty. This is what I do day in and day out. <laughs> um, so surrogates in our program, we have there's a lot of interest to become a surrogate, but the women who actually pass our screening process and make it to the end to be able to match with the tenant parents is a very, very, very small number. Um, in our program, we only end up accepting about one to two percent of the applicants who begin the application with us. Um, and that is because our process is very extensive, it's very long, and we really looking are looking for the healthiest, you know, the women who are going to, you know, that we feel confident will succeed in this in, in the surrogacy process because it's a very lengthy process and you know it requires a lot of women. And so in addition to that, one of the things I get asked all all the time is, you know, who are these women that apply? Who wants to be a surrogate? Um, and you know it's really women who genuinely genuinely want to help others you know a lot of the women that i speak to they've known someone who has been affected by infertility or they have close friends that are in same-sex relationship or they learned about surrogacy um, online or on tv surrogacy has become much more mainstream in recent years and so you know that interest is sparked and they come to our program and apply um, but when they apply to us, there's a multi-stage screening process. And so it starts with our application. You know, we're looking for surrogates within a certain BMI range. Surrogates in our program are between the ages of 21 and 41. They have to have given birth to at least one healthy child. Most of the surrogates in our program have two or three children. Um, they have to live in a surrogate-friendly state in the United States. 
they're, you know, we're screening for that they're not using illegal drugs, smoking cigarettes, or abusing alcohol. Um, and then, so once we kind of get through that initial screening phase, then the next phase would be for them to complete the social work screening with a social worker and complete completing psychological testing. And so that's a very lengthy conversation with the surrogate. We also screen her primary support person. So it's really important to circle and for just surrogacy in general that it, you know, it really takes a village for a surrogate to get through the process. And so you know, having someone that we've designated as a primary support person, but also to know that her community is supportive of this, that she has people there if there's an emergency. You know, these are all the types of things that are the social workers going over. The social worker is also going in depth about, you know, making sure that she really understands the commitment that she's making, so that, you know, she she is making a good decision for her and her family, but also assessing her readiness to 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 move forward in surrogacy that and that she can, you know, handle this process, but also be a good fit for intended parents in our program. And then if she passes that stage, then she then moves on to matching with intended parents. And all surrogates in our program are medically pre-approved by our IVF doctor liaison. But if you are working with a different IVF clinic, we always seek medical pre-approval from whatever clinic that you are working with. So when you enter the matching process and you are working with a specific surrogate, we will always make sure that your doctor is comfortable with her medical candidacy and her screening results that, that we will provide. So now I'll return it back to Dean, who's going to talk about legal, the legal aspects of sur surrogacy, insurance, and costs. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hello again. Um, so before I get into it, I just want to give you a quick um, background on myself. So I'm Dean Hutchison, as I mentioned earlier. I'm the current Vice President Director of Legal Services here at Circle. Um, I've been with Circle nearly 16 years. Uh, my first job out of law school was working for our founder. John Weltman um, for both Circle and back then for John's private legal practice. Um, Circle is roughly 24, 25 years old now, um, kind of spawned from John and his husband Cliff. Um, they did surrogacy that uh, their second child was born 24 years ago and Circle kind of started um, uh, organically from people coming to them to say, how did you do this? What advice do you have? How can I do this legally? Um, so I work directly for John um, for uh, a year with Circle and John's legal practice, and I worked at the law firm. Circle used to be uh, located inside of, um, spending a good chunk of my time learning um, about surrogacy and uh, drafting contracts and doing parentage work. Um, Circle continued to expand during that five-year period and separated from that law firm to the, our offices today. Um, and really became full service surrogacy and there was no more of that separate legal uh, legal work that was being done outside of um, the surrogacy realm. And I followed John uh, soon after he had left the firm to stay with the, the Circle Legal Department. Um, outside of Circle, I currently chair the American Bar Association's Assisted Reproductive Technology Law Committee, um, which is a group of about 500 lawyers worldwide that focus on this area. So um, I help uh, set up twice yearly conferences, get involved in some international and domestic legislation and webinars and seminars. So I try and stay as involved as I can because as many of you know, listening, this is a, an ever-changing area um, uh, of law uh, throughout not only our country, but throughout the world. Um, so um, just in general, from a circle perspective, uh, since we grew out of that law firm, we kind of created a law firm internally here uh, as the legal work is a pretty substantial part of this process. So right now we have 10 licensed attorneys in-house at Circle, um, some with you know three years experience, some with close to 20 years experience or 30 years of John's experience. Um, but whatever it is, basically their whole careers, whether it's that three or 30, have kind of been spent in this industry. Um, and combined over our team, we have over 100 years of, of legal experience. Um, I'm going to give a very general overview of the law, of the insurance, of the costs. Um, uh, and if you decide to have that further consultation, we'll obviously talk more specific about your case because everyone's case is going to be a little different in terms of legal needs and wants. Um, but basically, every, every uh, intended parent for our program, um, they're going to have an individualized legal plan. So we're going to match you a certain way. We're going to um, you create the legal work a certain way, the insurance a certain way, particularly for your case. Um, so you'll have that kind of individual expertise. Um, from a team perspective, you're not dealing with 10 attorneys at once. I don't want to scare everyone and have you leave the, uh, leave the webinar. 
Um, part of that team, uh, you'll have one attorney who's, who's attached to your team. So you'll have one point person from the legal team uh, who's guiding you through the different experiences. Um, we meet every other week as a team. I meet individually with the attorneys daily pretty much. So we're still all involved in the cases, but to make it easier on you, you're only, you're only working with one attorney um, from the circle team. Um, so the, the major legal considerations, they really kind of divide into the three stages of the process. Um, there's the match, which Salvig mentioned more from a process standpoint, there's the legal contracts, and then there's the parentage rights. So from a matching perspective, the applicable law is important, and, and what we wrote here is really usually the most important law in this whole, this whole situation is going to be the law of the state where the surrogate's delivering the baby. Because um, that's going to be the law that deals with parentage initially, that deals with the surrogacy itself, that deals with the birth certificates. Um, the one little um, kind of caveat to that is sometimes if any of the process is done in California or if any of the parties live in California or if even if you just fly to California and sign the agreement, technically California law can have some jurisdiction over the case. Um, so, you know, in those cases where Potentially, it's there's an easier way to get a decision in California, and a portion of the case was done there. We can apply California law, uh, but otherwise, we're almost always applying the law of the state where the surrogates deliver. Um, we only accept surrogates from states where the legal practice um, either has some codified law, or statutory law, or case-driven law. Um, we don't want to work in states number one where where surrogacy is prohibited, and right now that's um, Michigan, Nebraska. Uh, and currently New York, although if any of you are from New York and you're watching the news, you'll know that for the second straight year, Governor Cuomo has endorsed the surrogacy legislation uh, to pass, and we're hoping this year that the, um, the New York Assembly will actually take up the bill and, and vote on it. Um, Michigan also has a law that, that um, our, my ABA committee has helped uh, try and draft, so there's a potential that Michigan comes off that list. And then there's a couple other states like Louisiana, Wyoming, where um, because there's not either the law is very strict as to how it applies and who can do surrogacy or there's zero law whatsoever and no one's ever done a surrogacy in that state. Um, we, we don't take surrogates from that. Um, <clears throat> from a contract perspective, so basically when I go going back, so when you match with a surrogate for your particular reasons, whether you want some type of court order or you need a birth certificate to look a certain way, we'll match you in a state where we know we can do that. Um, when you match with the surrogate, the next phase is contract. So you'll have a legal contract with your surrogate. You'll also have a legal contract with your egg donor. Uh, your circle attorney will represent you throughout that process. Um, they're going to be the one who drafts it first, gets it to you for review, sets up a time to go over any questions or comments you have, and then it's going to go out to an independent attorney representing either the donor or the surrogate. So they have their own private lawyers throughout the process um, that are separate from circle. Um, uh, I'd say, for the most part, the contracts have a pretty simple back and forth negotiation. Um, there, you know, tends not to be some major adversarial issue coming up, and if there is, you probably shouldn't match with that person to begin with. Um, it's usually just kind of you know, small things that you go back and forth on. Um, so it takes, I'd say, the donor contract maybe a week or two to finalize. The surrogate contract will take a little longer just because it's a, a lot more detailed, longer relationship, so maybe three to five weeks uh, to complete a contract. Uh, uh, but again, your attorney is going to be representing you throughout that process, and the surrogate and donor will have their own. Um, part of that um, contract is also, you know, there's going to be language in the contract that kind of what we say makes the pregnancy your pregnancy. Um, obviously, the surrogate is carrying the child. Um, she's treated as the patient in all the doctor visits because it's her body and she's the one who's giving birth. Um, but we want to give you, obviously, certain decision making rights throughout the process. So if issues arise or if questions come up from her medical provider that you have a voice there because it is um, it's going to be your child in the end. So we want to make sure you're um, fully informed of everything that's going on and you're helping um, you know, uh, come to conclusions on those decisions when they happen. Um, and then the, the final piece is the parentage right. So obviously the most important part of this whole process um, from a legal perspective is securing the intended parents' parentage rights in the state where that baby is being delivered. Uh, each state has a different set of laws. We live in um, a country where all 50 states have a whole different um, uh, set of statutory and case laws, so uh, each state's going to have a little different process. Um, the buzzword that most people talk about when they hear surrogacy or they talk about surrogacy is pre-birth orders, which are court orders that come prior to birth 
um, that establish an intended parent's rights over the child that create birth certificate one with only the intended parent or parents' names um, and that tell the hospital they're the parents. Um, it's not available in every state for every couple, so it depends on your, um, you know, the, whether you're married or not, whether you're using a donor or not, um, or whether the state's laws allow for pre-birth orders. So we're going to know specifically what you want and match accordingly in those cases. Um, some states require the legal work to happen post-birth just because they have a kind of 1970s parentage act still in place. Um, and some states require non-genetic parents to do a, what's called a second parent adoption. It's, it's not a full adoption. It's a very uh, quick and easy process, but some people just don't want to go through an adoption process uh, in the end after this. So um, we just need to know that in advance of matching. Um, insurance. So um, from an insurance perspective, I'll kind of touch on a couple different areas. One will be how your insurance comes into play, one about the surrogates, one about some added benefits, and then kind of how our program works. So um, before you fully engage in this process, um, there's a couple things you want to look at from your own insurance. Number one is the coverage of dependents, so adding a child to your plan. Um, usually if you have a PPO plan, it's the best because more than likely your surrogate's either going to be in a different state or a different network, and you want to make sure that your coverage for that newborn child that you're going to be responsible for from date of birth um, is going to be not much different than if your child was born in your own hospital or in your own state. Uh, so it's good to review your insurance policies to see that there's no major issues between uh, covering at home state versus out of state. Um, also from your insurance, you want to look at your IVF coverage, uh, whether you're a single, same sex, or heterosexual couple, um, depending on how potential IVF coverage is listed in your um, in your insurance documents, you may have some, some coverage, whether it's just the blood work or the uh, fertility testing, sometimes the creation of the embryo, sometimes all of it. So it's worth um, you're doing an investigation into whether or not you have any type of um, IVF coverage. Um, on top of that, depending how big your company is, some companies of 500 or more employees can uh, be a part of a, uh, there's a couple, there's a couple different fertility based um, insurance companies out there, one called Progeny, one called Carrot, um, where your company for very low cost can offer all of its employees um, fertility based or uh, IVF based insurance. Um, and there's a huge network of, of IVF clinics that are um, a part of this Progeny and Carrot network. Um, so if you're a company of 500 or more employees and you want to talk to your HR about something that's a benefit to all employees, this is one, one place. Uh, for them to look. Uh, and I think it gives them certain HRC credibility too, where they get certain certain certifications if they offer such insurance. Um, on top of that, you just want to go to your HR too. You may have hidden benefits you don't know about that are outside your insurance um, that companies are beginning to offer, whether it's just IVF based, uh, adoption based, legal based. Um, a lot of companies are offering different programs for employees that the employees have no idea they have. We've seen Companies offer as little as $5,000 grants to companies that offer as big as 60,000 grants to companies that have insurance policies that actually cover the entire surrogacy, including all the surrogates' medical costs. So it's worth doing those investigations because uh, you may you know, find kind of a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that your company offers a bunch of things you had no idea um, they offered. Um, now, the, that's kind of everything on your side. You also have a surrogate, obviously, who needs insurance or coverage for this process. Um, I'd say right now, um, and Salve can come on later and correct me if I'm wrong, but probably about half of the surrogates that apply um, to our program have health insurance that should cover a surrogate pregnancy, um, and then half have usually health insurance, but it has some exclusion for surrogacy. So, as many of you know, insurance companies don't like to pay for things and try and find ways they don't have to pay for things. Um, so it's about 50-50 on what the surrogate's insurance basis is. It really doesn't matter in our program, and I'll talk about it a little in a second on how we're fixed fee, but whether your surrogate has insurance or not, the costs tend to be about the same. So what we did is basically create a program where you pay a flat fee associated with insurance and medical related costs for a pregnancy and delivery that are, that's covering everything. And if it goes above that number that we asked for, circles on the hook for it. Um, uh, and it usually is around the number we asked, so there's, there's not many times where it's going to be less. Um, on top of that, 
that cost, that, that, that number that covers all the insurance is not only going to be kind of the regular health insurance that covers the pregnancy and delivery, but there's going to be a life insurance product purchased for your surrogate to protect um, her family and any beneficiaries in case something was to happen to her during the pregnancy. Um, there's going to be an insurance to protect both donors and surrogates for the IVF process. So if they have any complications from a, a medication or procedure standpoint, and there's also going to be an insurance we helped create for um, uh, for lost wages or, or bed rest. So if a surrogate was to need to go on elongated bed rest, uh, we helped create a plan that for uh, um, you know, a flat fee for the intended parents, the surrogate um, has unlimited bed rest to a certain stage, so um, ways to protect. Um, so kind of that, that last wave outside of the insurance that you have and the insurance you either have or put in place for the surrogate is just kind of how our programs have their own self-insurance. So um, beginning in 2020, uh, already beginning now in 2020 over here, um, we offer really two programs for intended parents. Um, one is kind of a fixed cost program that is a transfer by transfer basis and then a journey protection guarantee program. Um, so for the fixed cost program, basically what we did is crunch numbers from the last four or five years of all the different surrogacy program or all the different surrogacy journeys we had um, and come up with kind of that average that um, intended parents pay above and beyond the cost and create a number that says, all right, you pay this number right up front, and this gets you through one transfer with your surrogate um, all the way through the end of the pregnancy and delivery. Um, if that transfer doesn't work, or if there's a miscarriage or something happens between that and birth, you pay another flat, and that number each time is $10,000 each time to continue on the process. So whether or not that first transfer, you know, there was a miscarriage and it's $30,000 was expended, um, or it was just a simple failed transfer and eight to ten thousand dollars was expended. You only pay a flat ten thousand dollars to get you through another transfer and get you to the end of the line uh, to have a child. Uh, what the Journey Pr Protection Guarantee Program is instead of paying each additional transfer of that ten thousand dollars up front, you can pay a flat ten thousand dollar fee on top of the fixed fee for the whole cost, and that gets you um, five embryo transfers. Um, and if you don't have a live, if you don't bring a baby home with you after that fifth transfer, um, you get 100% of your agency fees back plus any potential unused expenses. So it's a way to um, kind of build in a full protection that, all right, um, we know they're with us for at least five transfers. And worst case scenario, if we don't get pregnant or something happens, we're going to get all of our agency fees back to either stop the program or continue on. Uh, you know, somewhere else. So, uh, you know, I, we wanted a way that um, intended parents could feel fully protected. Um, you know, I always tell people, and I'll get to cost next, but we're not going to really beat any other agencies on costs in a perfect journey, um, but mainly because we build in these, uh, our program to help all of our intended parents so that, you know, maybe in the worst case scenario, you have a perfect journey and you spent an extra, you know, 10000 above and beyond what you would have spent. Uh, but you're never in a situation where you're having an awful journey and you've expended an extra eighty to one hundred thousand dollars on um, these different costs. Um, what these costs don't include, just so uh, we talk about, uh, the only things that aren't going to be included in that fixed fee program are going to be your own travel. So obviously, you're going to go to your clinic if it's um, a travel piece. You're going to go to your the child's birth, um, and you'll probably go visit the surrogate during the pregnancy at least once. Um, the baby's cost of the hospital, which is covered you by insurance, but that's not good. That's going to be outside of the fixed fee. And then whatever the IVF costs are. So um, when you're looking at IVF clinics, they'll have programs similar to ours. You can just pay, you know, basically for regular IVF and you're paying as you go, or you can pay for unlimited IVF for a set fee and then you're fully fixing the whole process. Um, it's tough to give a number on cost just because you're each in a different scenario. Uh, but you figure somewhere, say, in the 130 to, you know, getting not thinking about IVF, probably somewhere in the 115 to 150 version, depending on which program you choose, not including IVF, and then adding in the IVF cost to it. Um, but I think, you know, after today, if you want to take that next step, have a consultation, obviously we can um, speak specifically about your case. 
Um, and we will be, I know we, we uh, occasionally get intended parents that come to us and they may already have only one embryo or two embryos and they're only gonna do one or two transfers. Um, you know, obviously we can always find a way to negotiate the contract so that, um, you know, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be stuck to one of these total fixed fee programs, et cetera, if you needed to have a separate program, particularly to your case. Um, so I think I've probably said enough and the two most important people on this panel um, should probably have a chance to speak. Uh, so at first I'm gonna introduce um, Will to you. As I mentioned earlier, Will is a parent through our program. He's got an adorable son, Cam, um, and he's gonna speak about his experience um, through surrogacy and, uh, and having a child through this program. So Will, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right, perfect, so it's all you. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Will Pollock, and I am a freelance writer and blogger in Atlanta. And I, I um, wanted to be a dad my whole life, basically. And I always kind of thought that I always, you know, sort of wanted to go down the surrogacy route, but um, you know, just didn't know whether I wanted to pull the trigger. And and I started the process with a different surrogacy company um, and didn't really feel a good connection with them. And so I decided to um, terminate that, uh, that agreement. And someone suggested that I get in touch with Circle. And, um, you know, just from beginning to end, it was a, just an amazing experience. And, um, I chose surrogacy because I I really wanted the of uh, the to continue the family line genetic genetically just as a preference um, and if you can see my uh, baby Cam um, <laughs> I'm kind of glad that um, I did that but um, and uh, <clears throat> you know it, it is it is a personal preference it is a um, it is not an inexpensive uh, endeavor, um, but I just want to say that it, it, you're in such great hands with the people at Circle. They they were everything um, that this other agency um, wasn't for me, and so much more. And you'll be supported throughout the throughout the whole process and. And I, I guess I'll leave with one little detail, which is that um, when I, f I found my egg donor and we went through the retrieval and we we were just about to start the the um, interviewing uh, surrogates and I really I honestly thought that I was going to need to interview you know two or three that was sort of my expectation. And then I did a, a Skype interview with Lindsay and, and Lindsay's husband. And, um, and I think, well, I don't even remember, I think it was maybe 30 or 40 minutes long, but I hung up with them and I just rushed to my computer and I said, they're the ones, I mean, Lindsay's, I've, Lindsay's amazing. And we, we got to do it. Um, I hope that they feel the same way. And, and luckily they did. And, and, um, I think it's, it speaks a lot to, to circles, um, uh, no, knowledge of the clients, but also mastery of, of the subject matter, um, that they could match somebody so perfect for me. Um, and Lindsay will be part of our family forever. So, um, with that, uh, I think that's all I got right now. Thanks, Will. Um, and as I, as we mentioned earlier, if you have questions for any of us, um, you, know, you can start filling them out on that that, that question panel on the side, um, and we're all going to stick around for 10, 20 minutes afterwards to answer them. So, um, any questions you have for any of us? But um, with that. Great introduction. I'll now hand the microphone over to Lindsay. Um, so, Lindsay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. So you are you are up. So here you go. All right. Um, 
my name's Lindsay. Uh, I am a surrogate with Circle. Um, so yeah, I, let's see, how did I get started? <laughs> um, I had known I wanted to be a surrogate um, for several years. I, I had talked about it with my husband even before we had my son. I said that, um, you know, when I when we decided we were done with our family, I want to do surrogacy. So he always knew that that was something I wanted to do. Of course, assuming that um, my pregnancies went well. And so, yeah, my husband had known that that was something I wanted to do. He was really supportive. And after we had my son, Avram, um, it was probably about a year later and we were, you know, I think we had decided that we weren't going to have any more um, and that we were done with our family. So I started to look in, I started looking into agencies and I, Circle was the first one I applied to. Um, I looked into a few and I think the reason I went with Circle was because they weren't, they weren't new, they were established. When you apply to an agency, you have to give a lot of information, you have to give all of your medical history, you have to give a lot of personal information about yourself, they interview you. Um, so I really just didn't want to just, you know, go with any, I just wanted to make sure who I went with had a good backing and a good history. So yeah, I um, went through their process and when it was time for matching, they sent me Will's profile pretty, it was pretty quickly. Once I was approved, they sent me his profile. And yeah, we had our Skype interview and um, we thought it went great. Um, my husband thought it went great. I thought it went great. Um, and yeah, that's how we were matched. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think the reason one of the reasons I wanted to do surrogacy is um, growing up, my my best friend's mom was a surrogate and this was probably 20 years ago. And I just remember um, when, when they were telling us about it and they were, they were telling us what she was doing, I just thought it was amazing. I didn't know, I mean, I was, 10 years old. <laughs> so I didn't know that was even possible. And I just thought it was so cool. And um, just the science of it, the fact that it was even possible was amazing. And I think in general, I've always been very interested in children. Um, I was a nanny before I had my son. And um, I just think that I've, I've worked with a lot of families and, you know, been with their kids closely and I just think I just think it's a beautiful thing and I just think that if if someone wants to be a parent that they should be able to be a parent and yeah I'm just excited that I could have helped or I could help someone awesome thanks thanks so much for your story so um, I'm going to open up the floor I thank obviously Lindsay Will and Solly um, for for their presentations tonight, and I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Um, if you have any questions, obviously you can start putting them right into um, uh, that the panel on the right. I'm just trying to technologically figure out how to do this. Um, uh, so you can continually ask questions. Uh, if they're to a particular person, I will get them on live, um, but otherwise. So, um, first question. What are the benefits for a surrogate to live uh, in a surrogacy friendly state? Um, obviously, um, the law is the most important part, so you want them in a state where um, uh, you, know, you can establish your parentage and you're not gonna have any issues from a legal perspective, um, that there's gonna be, you know, you're not gonna go through a prolonged legal issue to get parentage rights. So that's obviously the first thing. Um, uh, but it just it just makes the process easier. There's no reason to be in one that's not friendly, um, and we're not going to match you uh, in one of those states. Um, 
there's a question about for delivery, do surrogates choose C-section or natural delivery? I, it's, it's a medical thing. So um, as long as there, there hasn't been a prior C-section or the doctors aren't requesting it, most of the times it's going to be a natural delivery. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if this, I can open it up, but there's no, a surrogate's not going to choose one way or the other for a certain reason. Particularly, we get sometimes intended parents that for timing purposes, um, are trying to force a C-section, intended parents are going to have the right to force a C-section just so they can make a flight home, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's the case. Um, how many transfers happen for the majority of the surrogacy? So this is a better question for IVF doctors. This is also a better question regarding whether or not you're using an egg donor, whether or not you're using your own embryos, whether, you know, age, et cetera. Um, most clinics, usually by the second or third transfer have a pretty high success rate. Um, some even now have a very high success rate on the first transfer, but again, it's specific to each case. Um, um, when dealing with a parent, will a person who is undetected HIV diagnosis, will they be able to participate in a surrogate program? Yes, there's a particular program called SPAR. It's run through the Bedford lab in Massachusetts. Um, we've had many parents. We've actually, I think our first one was in the, I think in the, essentially in the 90s. We've had a lot of parents through that SPAR program. Um, but yes, there is a program you can go through where um, uh, they, they, they test the, a, the HIV levels as well as they wash the sperm and then they do the sperm freezing and send it to the IVF clinic of your choice to do the surrogacy. Um, for the match types, do the egg donor and future parent have to agree on the type, or is it based on what the future parent wants? So um, it's 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 really really based on what the parent wants. Obviously, if there's a donor that's applied that only wants to be anonymous, then you can't really force her to be known. Um, but in terms of the relationship post uh, egg donation, it's really guided by the intended parents. Um, so usually, what the contract talks about open you know open relationship, but the parents can reach out first in a sense, or you can, I mean, you can craft that contract. But um, usually when you're looking at donors and you see what their status is, if there's one you really like, but she's say anonymous, we can obviously reach out to her and find out if she would you know, have any willingness to be uh, semi-known or known. Um, but it is usually a mutual decision. Uh, there's a question about how long is the consultation and is there a cost? So all the RR consults are free. Um, I know I jumped the gun on these questions, and there's a couple more slides that talk about consultations. Uh, as as one of my um, people is in here shaking her head at me, uh, but our consultations are usually about two hours. Um, it's usually about an, 45 minutes to an hour with a process consult, 45 minutes to an hour with a legal consultant, um, and they are free of charge. We do them over Skype. We do them in person. We do them in the office. We do them when we're traveling. So. Um, whatever is easiest for you, we can um, accommodate your schedule. We, we usually set aside at least one weekend a month where we do them in person on Skype in the office. We usually set aside a couple weeknights um, a month as well. So for people that want to do it off hour, we, um, we make it we make time available. Do surrogacy costs vary depending on where the surrogate is located? So the only thing that's really going to vary in our program because everything is fixed is the surrogate's actual fee. So no matter what the fixed program cost is, you, you are still paying the exact, the surrogate's actual fee, whatever her base fee is. Um, in some states, surrogates will have a higher base fee um, because of demand or that's just what's going on. Uh, California, for example, that's probably had the longest history of surrogacy. There's a lot of agencies there as well as a lot of surrogates and a lot of people want California surrogates. So California surrogates tend to have a higher starting base fee. Um, so it will impact it a little, um, but really that's the only place because everything else is fixed in nature. Can you talk generally about the length of time from an IP applica application to surrogate matching to transfer? So. Um, the application is tough because it's really from when you agree to sign on. So uh, most people, I think the majority, sign on to be a client within three months of their consultation date. 
Um, and right now we're matching, we say less than five months from match time, less than five months from signing the agreement to when you'll match with the surrogate. Obviously, if you have any specific requirements or request a certain state, um, that can impact your match time. So it's not always in that exact time frame. Or, uh, but um, so from there, say it takes about five months or so to match or potentially a little less, it takes about a month to complete contracts. Um, and then maybe, you know, maybe from the time you complete contract another 30 to 60 days to get to an embryo transfer. Um, so we say about um, 15 to 20 months or so from start to finish to get to a baby. Um, uh, so, all right. Um, is there anything that outlines the cost that should be expected throughout the full process? So our website has a whole cost section you can go to. Um, again, it's going to be particular to whether you're surrogate only or you're using a donor, um, and then you're going to have to add in your IVF costs. Um, you know, so it depends on all those different scenarios. Um, so if you just go to the website and the cost, you'd be able to, to get to a number. Um, uh, websites, you go to the parent tab, and then there's a surrogacy process under there with the programs and costs, so you can get the full numbers. Um, there. Are IPs part of the decisions on how many eggs are transferred? Uh, yes, and we would. The only thing is, you need to know those that information prior to matching with a surrogate. Um, industry standard has kind of drifted towards single embryo transfers, unless there's a medical reason or a you know the embryo quality isn't that great. So most doctors and clinics will push for single embryo transfers. And because of the higher risk pregnancy with twins or multiple embryo transfer, most surrogates want to only carry uh, single embryo transfers uh, or to, to carry, um, carry singletons. So um, obviously you're still a part of that, though. You're going to have that decision in the end if you want to try for twins and your clinic is okay with it. We just need to know that in advance of matching with a surrogate. So we find a surrogate um, who's willing to have a multiple embryo transfer. Can you clarify the five embryo transfer guarantee? If you pay the ten thousand, does that cover the cost of the transfer, or does the ten thousand go to the surrogate for the additional transfers? So that ten thousand dollar additional payment covers everything. So, um, you know, if your journey after five transfers costs three hundred fifty thousand instead of the hundred eighty thousand or so you spent, um, circles on the hook for everything above and beyond that hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. We we've always had a fixed program, not not this journey guarantee, but similar in a, you know, the case I you know, don't want to highlight that much, but I'll highlight is we had a, a couple, they were a heterosexual couple from Australia that had um, a 24 and a half week delivery. They were actually the first people that ever took part in our fixed fee program. Um, the child um, did not survive the hospital stay. Um, they had expended basically the whole cost of a journey to that stage uh, because of how long, far along the pregnancy was. Um, you know, obviously, they took a lot of time to grieve and to um, kind of get their head straight, but wanted to you know, continue on the process and match with surrogate and, and have another and have another go at it. And um, they didn't pay any money other than their own travel to continue on in the process. Um, we matched them with a new surrogate, covered insurance and other expenses as well as surrogate's fees. Um, they were part of a fixed nature IVF program with an IVF clinic too, so there was no IVF cost related. Um, and they were able to have a child um, about a year and a half after um, losing their purse. So um, it's it, it's kind of like a catastrophic protection. You pay that extra ten thousand, you know, other than your own travel um, uh, and you know the cost I mentioned earlier, your your insurance and your cost for the baby, you're not paying anything above and beyond. Don't like to pay. Are two embryo transfers permitted? Uh, yes, they are. Um, uh, you can keep asking questions. I'm actually going to filter through the last couple of slides. Uh, uh, let me see. The first step, share your story with us. Uh, so this is what I was saying earlier. If you want to have a consultation <laughs> with Circle, um, uh, we're available via Skype, Zoom, in person. Um, we do them um, you know, seven days a week, really. We have uh, a set weekend every month. We're in different countries and different states. Every month, we're um, 
Uh, we do nighttime ones at the consult as well. Uh, I mean, at the office, so that you know we can we can meet your demands. Um, so if you can only meet after hours, we're happy to find a time that works for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you'll speak with a process consultant and attorney, um, and then we'll obviously ask to share your story of why you're thinking about surrogacy, why you want children, you know, what your support system is like, et cetera. Um, the travel I talked about earlier is all here. As I said, we're, we're always doing in-person consults in New York, Massachusetts, and California every month. Um, and then we pick different cities throughout the year to go to, to travel to. If there's anyone on here um, that's in a city that's not listed in these first three months and you think it'd be a good place to travel to, um, we're happy to kind of come on day visits um, because we have a lot of relationships with clinics throughout the country too. So we can combine uh, meetings with clients with meetings with IVF clinics that we work with a lot. Um, and on this page is the, you can email, you can go to our website and try and set up a consultation. There's a page where you can go um, to fill out a registration form or you can email Lauren Enterkin directly, um, whose email is on the stage. So I'll go back to the questions that are being asked. Um, what are the age ranges to be qualified as a parent? So we have different ranges. It's um, uh, right now, I believe, and if I'm, uh, I will, make sure I uh, right because I actually I know we're in the process of clarifying it and I think Solvig was Solvig were you in that last meeting on the um, age ranges I just made you live for intended parents for intended parents yeah I wasn't all right so I think it's a you can tell me if I you think it's right I think it's a combined 110 for a couple correct I believe so. Uh, and then one can't be over a certain age. I'll I'll clarify. And then for singles, I think it's up to 55 um, before you sign on. Um, and I will work on getting clarification. Um, why do? Um, so I'll come back to that. Um, can IPs make the choice on fetus gender? So. Um, almost everyone nowadays in most clinics will have you do what's called PGS testing, which is pre-genetic screening of the embryos. Um, and in that process, other than you know, finding out if there's any genetic issues with the embryos, they can also find out the sex. So you'll know if you do pre-genetic -pre screening, you'll know the sex of each embryo. Um, so you can choose to implant you know, only female embryos or only male embryos. Uh, the only thing I would say is that particular clinics, particularly if you're working with a clinic where you're doing some type of unlimited or some type of guarantee program with the clinic, um, they may have issue, you know, if you don't pick the best embryo each time and you're picking by gender. If your best embryo is a female but you only want a male, they may not allow you to be in their unlimited program. Are you aware of any PPO insurers that would help alleviate the burden of the cost for same-sex couples? Um, not offhand. I mean, particularly in the states that mandate fertility coverage, which now is, I know, I think Massachusetts, uh, I think New York, New Jersey, maybe North, maybe New Hampshire just did it. But if there if there is any IVF coverage in your policy. Um, depending on how it's worded and how ambiguous the language is on what constitutes infertility, I know a lot of same-sex couples have at least petitioned their insurance companies for some type of coverage. Um, and in those states where there's mandated coverage, some of them have been successful. Um, sometimes it's, as I mentioned, sometimes it's only for the blood testing or the fertility testing or potentially just the um, fertilization of the embryo, but not the actual transfers, um, is a place to look. I mean, also for same-sex couples, there's an organization called Men Having Babies. Um, their website, I think, is just menhavingbabies.org. They have a program called a GPAP program, which is kind of like a, I say a charity program, but it's a grant program in a way where um, same-sex couples or, or gay singles can apply, um, and if they get um, there's two levels of it. GPAP one certification gives them certain discounts at surrogacy agencies, IVF clinics, sometimes egg donor agencies, and insurance. 
and then a GPAP2 gives almost full grant of the money to do the process. Um, we are um, supporters of this program. We do a pretty high number of GPAP1 surrogacies a year where we give a pretty substantial discount to parents that get approved for that. And we also, um, we're part of GPAP2, which gives away, we give all of our services for free. Um, intended parents still pay for donor fees and surrogate fees and things like that, but they don't pay agency fees and, and legal fees. Um, all right, so I have that eight question. So um, up to combined 110, if it's a couple where um, one of the IPs can be up to 60, um, no one over 63 without a case by case consideration. So um, on occasion, you know, if, if there is a couple, we've, we've gone over that 60 number. Um, and then for um, singles, the minimum age is 25. Um, the maximum age is 55. So you're going to be, you have to sign on before your 55th birthday. Um, Um, this question is if mixed sperm is accepted, um, it's probably going to be more of a question to the IVF clinic um, because I know, I'm sure that most of them will do it, um, but that has, that's going to be more to do with an IVF. Um, so is everything legal in Boston? And the, yes, we have, so we don't have a statutory law in Massachusetts. I, we, I, I have assisted and drafted one, but it's not been approved, but we do have 25-year case law history, so yes, you can do surrogacy in Massachusetts. Um, and then someone wrote a question of having a potential donor that's 36, if that is okay. Um, usually, from an egg donor standpoint, most IVF or most egg donor agencies only accept to 30 or 32. Um, doesn't mean you can't use someone over 32. Um, you should just want to get fertility testing done, um, and if she has proven fertility as well before, that can help, but the age of 36 isn't a barring factor, but you'd want to get, um, uh, have testing done at an IVF clinic. Or... Can an female intended parent donate extra eggs to mitigate costs? I mean, to, if you're within a certain age bracket, you may be able to become an egg donor. Um, you know, separate from your own case, um, and that could potentially mitigate costs, but you couldn't, we don't have a egg bank per se where we take an exchange, but um, if you reach, if you meet certain criteria for different egg, egg donor agencies, you may be able to become a donor, um, and therefore uh, the payment you would receive as a donor would mitigate costs. Um, it says, the next question is, there's a number of surrogates on Circle's website from New York, I believe was cited. That, to, to, I'm, I think it's probably eight donors that are on the site. We don't have highlighted surrogates on our website. We've never had surrogates from New York. Um, so compensated surrogacy is currently legally in New York. There are, it is allowed to do what's called altruistic surrogacy in New York. We, we've never, we don't do it there, but uh, you still can do surrogacy there. But I would guess that if there are people highlight, or if there's anyone on our website from New York, it would most likely be an egg donor, not a surrogate, because um, we don't have a live active surrogate database, but we do have a um, donor database. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping, as I mentioned earlier, um, that um, New York does become legal very soon. Uh, it appears that it um, is on the track too. Um, so there's a question about how do most people afford to go through the process. So uh, obviously there's many different ways to do it. There, are, there are, um, uh, there's different charities that offer grants. There's um, uh, so some people use home equity lines to do it. Um, we're going to be um, launching our own financing come soon, where I think about half of the cost you can finance over three to six years, depending on you want, depending on. Uh, you still have to apply and there'll be credit scores, et cetera. But um, I think the soft launch will hopefully come in February, March, where it's about 11 states and then we'll add more states. Um, but it's a whole host of different ways that people you know, afford it, whether it's 
uh, personal loans, whether it's family loans, whether it's um, you know uh, grants from different different charities. Um, there's there's you know, ways to do it. Um, uh, you know, happy to answer any specific any questions you have uh, directly to. Um, I know Lauren's emails there. You can always email her and say or that you know ask for my email that, that if you've gone through this. Um, but yeah. Um, and just to clarify too, I know there was that New York question. Um, so even though surrogacy is not legal in New York at the moment, we still have lots of intended parents from New York. Um, so you can do surrogacy as a New Yorker outside of the state. Um, you just can't use a compensated surrogate from New York and do parentage work. Um, so um, uh, you know we have probably the biggest circle parent historical parent bases from New York. Um, so we've helped a lot of parents there. It's just at the moment, hopefully by the fall, we won't be saying this anymore and there'll be a new statute that's in effect, um, but you just can't pick a compensated surrogate from the state of New York. So I'll keep it open a couple more minutes. If any other questions come in? Okay, it looks like there's no more questions. Um, so again, I wanna thank Lindsay, Solvig, and Will for their time tonight. Oh, wait, we just had one. <laughs> uh, do we have a sperm bank donor base information for parents seeking use of a sperm donor as well? Um, so we don't have one. I know that there's one in the Seattle cryobank and I believe California cryobank are probably the two biggest. Um, if again, if you uh, go back a slide, if you want to email Lauren to, to you know tell her you were on the, the webinar and had that one question, um, I think Seattle though and California Cryo are probably the two biggest um, sperm donor banks that I know of. Um, uh, but we can get that answer. What other grants, etc., do you know of besides men having babies? Well. We, um, so I know there's a one called Baby Quest. Um, that's Baby and then Quest Q U E S T. Um, you know I know for infertility heterosexual couples I know there is um, uh, Resolve has some grants. You know particular people. Um, there's a there's a Expect Miracles is one that's more for medical or cancer related reasons where people are infertile. Um, there is a, uh, man, uh, there's a company I believe called AGC for infertile couples. I believe that stands for angry girls club. I'm pretty sure it's AGC. It's a Boston based one. Um, there's a lot of small ones, um, um, that I know of. Um, so, um, you know, it, it takes some research, um, but, and, that's the those are the places I would look, uh, and then I believe like a big place like Resolve, particularly for infertility reasons, probably has a whole slew of different charities um, that are connected to them. Okay, I think that's it. So again, I'm gonna. Um, Thank Lindsay, Will, and Solvig for their time tonight. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, attendance, for your questions. Um, we'd love to see all of you, if not all of you, some of you in a future consultation. Um, if you have any specific questions after tonight, that email Lauren's email, Lauren Enterkin. Um, you can email her directly, and she can come to whichever one of us is, uh, can answer the question. Um, or she can give you out my email address. I'm happy to answer anything specific. Um, so, um, as I said, we're going to download this. Once it's uploaded, it'll be emailed to everyone who attended. Um, so you can have those questions and you can re-listen to the process. So thank you again. And have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.